Come, O blessed spirit of holy fear, penetrate my inmost heart, that I may set you, my Lord and God, before my face forever. Help me to shun all things that can offend you, and make me worthy to appear before the pure eyes of your divine majesty. In heaven, where you live and reign in the unity of the ever-blessed Trinity, God, world without end. Amen. Be not afraid. That was the mantra of our most recent pontiff to be canonized. St. John Paul II, some, him, some called him St. John Paul the Great. Be not afraid. Open wide the doors to Christ. That echoed from the balcony of St. Peter's when he was first elected until the end of his pontificate, be not afraid. And he didn't just come up with those words out of thin air. We hear them in scripture over 100 times in some variation. Have no fear. Be not afraid. Again and again and again and again and again from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. We are called to have no fear. To be not afraid. So how do we square that? This call to have no fear. To never be afraid. To cast all our cares upon him. How do we square that with this gift of fear that we are praying for today. How does a gift of fear go with an admonition to never be afraid? We're going to break this down together uh, and I get to do it with you because I am an expert on fear. I have over 30 years of experience being afraid of things. Mostly things I have absolutely no business being afraid of. You see, it all started with Aloysius. You may not be old enough to remember him, but I'm sure you know this guy. If this worked correctly, Big Bird just appeared over my little pointer finger there. If not, imagine Big Bird here. Big Bird uh, was a character on Sesame Street, a giant yellow bird who was happy and fun. Uh, but he had a friend named Mr. Aloysius Snuffleupagus. Have a look. So, Snuffy was frightening. I mean, have a look at those eyes. That is the stuff that nightmares are made of, or at least my little nightmares when I was a young boy. And after Snuffleupagus, there was the Filter Queen. That was the most frightening vacuum that... I ever encountered until I learned that you could stand on the little casters and ride it around <laughs> and then it became kind of fun except it had a water filter and when you stood on the caster sometimes you would tip it and spill the nasty dirty vacuum water all over your mother's carpet um, so there was something else to be afraid of so we're all afraid of things though I'm afraid of of, of all sorts of things. As I grew up, I became afraid of more logical things like girls. And then as I got even older, I was afraid of marriage and children. And now I have seven of them. Uh, children, not marriages. Just one marriage and a bunch of kids. Um, but we get afraid of all sorts of things. We're afraid of pain. We're afraid of missing out. I believe it's what you kids call the FOMO these days, or maybe that was those days because I'm so old that is no longer a current reference. I don't care. Uh, we're also afraid of bad things. Things that can hurt us. Large, salivating, sharp-toothed dogs come to mind. But we're not afraid of good things. Like, I mean, I assume you've never been walking down the hallway of your school and your best friend walked up and was like, Hey, do you want this chocolate bar? And you were like, No! Get away from me, Satan! Unless you have a deep, deep, unhealthy aversion to chocolate bars. 
which is a deep and unhealthy problem. Or you are lactose intolerant, which is a completely different problem that we don't have time to discuss here. So maybe you're avoiding that. But other than that, we're not afraid of these good things. No one walks up to you and is like, here's $2,000 over you. And you're like, oh no, not money. You know, we're not afraid of good things. Or at least we shouldn't be. Should we? No. No, I, I think I think it's right. We shouldn't be afraid of good things. So why should we fear God? The essence of all that is good. When I can't figure out the answer to some of these things or some of these terms that we encounter in our life of faith, I turn often to the Catholic Encyclopedia or the Catholic Dictionary because they tend to know the answer and I like answers. So let's read together the definition from the Catholic Dictionary. Some of it may appear on your screen if I do this right. If not, just listen. I'm going to read it through and then we're going to break it down. Infused, oh, gift of fear. An infused gift of the Holy Spirit that confirms the virtue of hope, inspires a person with profound respect for the majesty of God and its corresponding effects, our protection from sin through the dread of offending the Lord, and a strong confidence in the power of his help. The fear of the Lord is not servile, but filial. It is based on the selfless love of God, whom it shrinks from offending. Whereas in servile fear the evil dreaded is punishment, in filial fear it is the fear of doing anything contrary to the will of God. The gift of fear comprises three principal elements. A vivid sense of God's greatness, a lively sorrow for the least faults committed, and a vigilant care in avoiding occasions of sin. It is expressed in the prayer of the psalmist. My whole being trembles before you, your ruling fills me with fear, Psalm 129, verse 120. One of its salutary effects is to induce a spirit of deep humility in dealing with others, especially with inferiors, since it makes a person aware that he or she stands constantly before the judgment of God. Clair comme la boue. For those of you who do not speak bad French, that means clear like mud? Question mark. Uh, probably not. So let's go through this a little slower. So, the gift of fear is an infused gift of the Holy Spirit. So, let's just stop there. A gift of the Holy Spirit. The Catechism of the Catholic Church in a number 1830 and 31 has this to say about gifts of the Holy Spirit. The moral life of Christians is sustained by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. These are permanent dispositions which make man docile in following the promptings of the Holy Spirit. They complete and perfect the virtues of those who receive them. They make the faithful docile in readily obeying divine inspirations. So the moral life of Christians is sustained by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The moral life of Christians is, is us, that's you and I. Our, our moral life is sustained, is held together by these gifts of the Holy Spirit, and they are permanent dispositions. You receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit in your baptism and you receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit in fullness at your confirmation at least those of you who are old enough to have been confirmed and they complete and perfect the virtues so the virtues being the opposite of the vices those good tendencies that we have they complete and perfect them and they make the faithful that's you and I docile in readily obeying divine inspirations those are those things that God calls us to do it makes us docile to them so that we will follow the will of God. So that is the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So the particular gift of fear is one of these infused gifts of the Holy Spirit that confirms the virtue of hope and inspires a person with a profound respect for the majesty of God. You remember that song that you've probably heard in youth group or summer camp or I pray that it's no longer sung, but it was when I was young and I'm sure it still is because it's so darn catchy. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns. And you do the little rain fingers from heaven above. You remember that one? With wisdom, power, and... I can't remember what the sign for love was. It changed over the years. But our God is an awesome God. I dislike this song. It's kind of annoying, but it's true. Our God is an awesome God. 
he is so full of, he should inspire in us awe, and he's so full of majesty. So we're to be inspired with a profound respect for him through this gift of fear. Its corresponding effects are protection from sin, so it protects us from sin because it causes us to dread offending the Lord. And it gives us a strong confidence in the power of his help. It goes on to say, the fear of the Lord is not servile, but filial. So servile refers to slaves, of or concerning slaves is what the dictionary defines it as. Whereas filial is of or concerning a son or a daughter. So the fear of the Lord is not like the fear that a slave would have of their master, but a fear that a child would have of their father. And it's not a fear in that like, ooh, daddy's going to spank me. But see, remember I said before, I have seven children. That is not seven. That is eight. Apparently counting is hard for me. It's a good thing my wife does the homeschooling. Um, so I have seven children. And particularly when they're little, you see this, although it continues as they grow up. But it's particularly apparent and cute in three, four, five-year-olds. Um, you know, sometimes they obey you because they know I'm going to get in trouble if I don't obey. But there are those moments where it's just purely out of love for daddy or love for mommy that they obey. And that's what, what this fear is. It's this fear of not wanting to disappoint or to hurt your relationship with the one that you love. This most important person in your life. I think this is so apparent in those young children because they still think mommy and daddy are are, are Superman, Superwoman. They're perfect. And as we grow up, we learn that mom and dad aren't perfect, but we begin to learn that our Father in Heaven is. And we need to love and desire to, to, to not harm that relationship with Him, to not sin. So, whereas in servile fear, the evil is dreaded, that definition said, the evil dreaded is punishment, in filial fear, it is the fear of doing anything contrary to the will of God. So, um, most of you probably go to confession, at least somewhat regularly. If you don't, I would strongly encourage you to. And when we go to confession, uh, we pray the act of contrition. And in one of the versions, it says, Oh my God, I am heartily sorry for having offended thee, because I dread the loss of heaven, and I fear the pains of hell. So that dread the loss of heaven and fear the pains of hell, that's the servile fear. But most of all, we say, because I dread the loss of heaven and fear the pains of hell, most of all because I have offended thee, my God, who art all good and deserving of all my love. And that's the filial fear. Because I have offended thee, my God, who art all good and deserving of all my love. It's not because something bad is going to happen to me. It's because I've done something that hurts you, my God, whom I love above all else. That definition went on to say the gift of fear comprises three principal elements. A vivid sense of God's greatness. We've already talked about that. The awesomeness, the majesty of God. So that's part number one. A lively sorrow for the least faults committed. So that's where we begin to feel sorry for even the little things that we do if they, if they harm our relationship with God because we want that close relationship with our Abba God, with our Father God, who loves us so much. And third is a vi vigilant care in avoiding the occasions of sin. So it's expressed in the, in the prayer of the psalmist, my whole being trembles before you. Your ruling fills me with fear. That was Psalm 119, verse 120. This vigilant care in avoiding sin. That's the end of the act of tradition we say, and that I may avoid the near occasion of sin. So we avoid putting ourselves in a position where we might sin because we don't want to cause offense. We don't want to accidentally do something that's going to hurt the one that we love. So imagine you're... Your dating gentleman, a very a beautiful young lady. And ladies, imagine that you're you're dating, you know, someone as strapping as me, and someone that you love deeply. Imagine that you have this loved one that you're with, uh, and and you love them, 
You just you want to please them. You want to you want to make them happy. Um, and gentlemen, you're with this 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 beautiful lady, and another girl walks by. You don't go, hey, honey. Well, you know that may be your initial reaction. Hey, honey, what's up? But if you do that while standing next to the uh, your girlfriend, uh, you're going to get dumped. That's what's going to happen. This was a public service announcement for all you young gentlemen. The more you know. But you you don't do that. You don't, hey, go after the... <laughs> I don't know what girl <laughs> is attracted to that. But I'm maybe there's one. I don't know. I have a wife, so I did something right. I don't know. But anyway, you do not chase... Um, these other beautiful young ladies when you have and you are with your girlfriend. It's just not something that you do because you're going to offend her. You're going to, you're going to damage that relationship. And the same way with our Father God. We don't put ourselves in occasions where we're going to be tempted to sin because we don't want to harm our relationship with Him. And that's what this gift of fear gives us. And then... It adds on at the end of this definition of, of the gift of fear. One of the salutary effects is to induce a spirit of deep humility. So if we have this gift of fear, it tends to give us a deep humility in dealing with others, especially with people who are in, with, with inferiors, since it makes a person aware that he or she stands constantly before the judgment of God. So it makes you humble in dealing with you know, your inferiors, your, your underclassmen, your, your um, younger siblings. So it's not necessarily that they are inferior in worth to you, but someone that you have some um, bit of authority over. For me as a parent, it's, you know, in dealing with my children, if I have this gift of fear, I am more humble in dealing with my children. Um, because we're aware that we're constantly before the judgment of God. And just as they're, they're constantly under our gaze. So... You know, it begins as this servile fear. It begins as a fear of punishment. But as we, as we learn and grow, um, we obey out of love for the one who loves us. When you look up fear in the dictionary, it gives you all the, the definition that you would expect. Um, but down at the very bottom when I was reading, it said archaic, as though it's no longer current, which I think is kind of stupid, but it's what it says. And then it says to regard, regard God with reverence and awe. And I think that sort of sums it up. This is that gift of yours to regard God with reverence and awe. God, you are an awesome God. And that we desire nothing but to stay in relationship with you. We don't want to hurt our relationship with you. Pope Francis uh, recently said it this way. The fear of the Lord the gift of the Holy Spirit doesn't mean being afraid of God. Since we know that God is our Father and He always loves and forgives us. It is no servile fear, but rather a joyful awareness of God's grandeur and the, a grateful realization that only in Him do our hearts find true peace. The Holy Father continued, When the Holy Spirit lives in our heart, He instills consolation and peace in us. And at the end of his talk, Pope Francis prayed. Let's try that again. At the end of his talk, Pope Francis prayed that the fear of the Lord would allow all of us to understand that one day everything will finish and we will be accountable to God. His prayer was this, and let's pray with him. Let us pray that the fear of God, together with the other gifts of the Holy Spirit, will renew us in faith and constantly remind us that in God, in God alone, do we find our ultimate happiness, freedom, and fulfillment. I'll read that one more time. Let us pray that the fear of God together with the other gifts of the Holy Spirit, will renew us in faith and constantly remind us that in God alone do we find our ultimate happiness, freedom, and fulfillment. Amen. So that is my prayer for all of you, brothers and sisters, that you would receive this gift of fear from the Holy Spirit 
and that it would remind you that in God alone do you find your ultimate happiness, freedom, and fulfillment. Amen.